The world is full of ordinary people, ordinary people just like you and me, who have actually done pretty extraordinary things. Things that you and I just look back on in awe, but we would walk past them on the street and not think a second that this person has led such an amazing life, all due to one thing, they've just backed themselves and they have become something that they are just great. My name's Kyle Reba and this podcast is about just that, ordinary people who are now showing us that it is possible for ordinary people like you and I to back themselves and become something amazing. So join me in listening to these people, listening to their stories, because who knows, one day I might be talking to you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kyle Reaver podcast. This is episode three of hundreds and thousands of them that we hope to do. And they are all a chance for us to interview people from all walks of life who have backed themselves, done some pretty cool stuff and things. And today's recipient is no exception to this. Beck Cooper. Yeah. Hi. Oops, oops. <laughs> <laughs> That's an in-house joke. Well, we might explain later. Um, how are you? I'm good. Good. You a little bit nervous? Um, I was before, but not so bad now. You're okay now? Yeah. All right. So we're going to jump straight into the questions because if I talk too much about Beck, it might give away um, what we want to talk about in whole. Um, but I will say that I am very excited about this chat because um, your story intrigues me and it's probably mm. a little bit on the inspiring side, I reckon, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I reckon you get a chance to own that, don't you? Yeah. You get a chance to back Starting yourself. Starting to, yeah. <laughs> All right. Birth to now in seven minutes. Okay. Go. So I was born in Darwin in 1984. Look at you. Hmm? Look at you. Look wherever you want. Okay. 1984 <laughs> in Darwin. Um, Making you 39. <laughs> oh, really? 39, yeah. Oh, I don't think you're that old. Oh, Sorry. Good. We're already digressing. Immaturity makes you stay fresh. Oh, she's immature. Yeah. So, <laughs> Keep going. Um, both of my parents are Scottish and I was born in Darwin, hoping to be born in Scotland. But anyway. Um, so I... they've been living in Australia for a while. Yeah, they met in Australia, um, but yeah, very Scottish. Mum goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so I did some schooling when I was five in Scotland, um, but my dad, he was a terrible alcoholic, so he left when I was about two, just took off. Mum didn't know where he was, so they got divorced. Um, I think he went back to Scotland. Haven't had anything to do with him. Since you were two? No, I've looked for him, but that's... Yeah, because I used to go back to Scotland with mum every so two years. Yeah. Um, so we would look through phone books in the library and things like that, but sort of tracked him down a few times when I was a bit older, but I had the choice to just let it go. Yeah, he yes, I have now. It's kind of getting embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was just me and mum. Mm -hmm. Um Mum struggled because she was a single mum and he wasn't around to help. So it was tough for mum, but like growing up, I didn't know that we were poor or struggled. Um, went to a Christian private school. So mum made sure that I was having the best of everything that I could have. Yeah. Um, and What sort of jobs did she do to get by? So she left school early because her family broke down. And so she put herself through, she was working just as a receptionist and put herself through TAFE. Yeah. She ended up doing a master's in business. Wow. So now she's like a big boss lady mm -hmm. for um, aged care facility. Awesome. Yes, it is. She's inspiring to me. I wish I worked a bit harder like her, but so it was tough for her. Yeah. She worked a few jobs to get me through that school. Yeah. Uh, and then I was doing really well in school. I played in the Nationals under 16s for six years. What sport? Soccer. Excellent. Yeah, I forgot that part. <laughs> my, That's okay. My auntie, she played for the Matildas for about 10 years, so it's right. like in our family. So I was sort of tracking to get to the adult women's national team, but mm. I had 16, some stuff happened at school, at a school party, and I pretty, everything pretty much went out the window because um, I was planning to study law. I was getting good enough marks too. 
and then I'm still I, in Darwin. Yeah, still in Darwin. Yeah. And so I was in year 12 when I was 16, year 11, and failed on school, met some other people at a public school, started using, sort of went from plot to pills to speed, and then within two years it was heroin. And so I was 18, I'd given up, you know, my sport, my school, things with mum are really bad. And then a family, a friend of mum's, they needed to live in nanny for their five kids in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So they took a huge chance on me and said, come and be a live in nanny. So I flew to Brisbane. Yeah. And then, you know, I got my act together the first time. Yeah, the first time. <laughs> There's been a few. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> first of a few. And uh, I did my nursing studies while I lived with them. And... Like I hadn't used again, but I'd started sort of alcohol started becoming a bit of a pattern. Yeah. And so I started partying, going out, clubbing, but I'd finished my nursing. Uh, I was working at Prince Charles Hospital in Brizzy mm -hmm. for Queensland Health and kind of halfway through my nursing, because I was a nurse for 10 years okay. for Queensland Health. And halfway through that, I was, you know, clubbing, meeting new people and always meet the wrong people it's like you're magnets to these people <laughs> and I got introduced to ice which I had never mm. never done before and I found that was worse oh, it was more addictive than heroin for me and so that I was still nursing but I was using and then I um, got introduced to this guy that was part of a bikey gang and it was like two different worlds I was like working in emergency one day and then partying with these Barkies and it's like I don't really belong here. Mm. I wasn't very gangster mm. <laughs> at all. <laughs> so it was just bizarre, you know. I had these two separate lives, and then um, towards the end of that ten years, things got really, really bad. And so this is still in Brisbane. Yes, still in yep. Brizzy. And because I had access to you know certain benzos and steroids, I these guys knew that I was a nurse. It was like, well, I can swap these things for the ice that I need. Right. So my habit was massive. I was using probably, God, you know, two grams a day, which is, you know, $1,500 worth. And then it all kind of exploded and I got caught and arrested. And because it was linked with the task force, maximum police, because of the bikies, it was very public because I was a nurse. It was on the news. I was in the news which mum saw, which was one of the worst days of my life because I oh, told her, yeah. And I forfeited my registration, but I was going to lose it. So court, the court case went on for about two years mm -hmm. because it was all entwined with these people that I wasn't even mm -hmm. very different to. But, um, and, you know, I was worried about, I couldn't make statements because that would affect, you know, my safety. It was yeah. just a mess. So... I went into rehab a year after I'd left nursing. So I went to Toowoomba and I was using massive amounts and drinking heaps. So the, I think the fourth or fifth day that I was there, I had seizures from withdrawing from alcohol because I hadn't detoxed. I told them I had, but I hadn't. And I hadn't realized that alcohol was such a big problem then. Um, mm. So I was surprised, but I ended up in that. A court happened six months later and, you know, it was at Supreme Court. I was looking to go to jail. I was just what mm. the plan was mm. and I mm. didn't, they gave me parole and it was just like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. So I stayed in the program and I finished, I was there for 19 months, wow. which was, it was a 12 month program, but I was a little bit slow you had a bit to do yeah and but I didn't really work on any of the reasons why I was in addiction like I didn't really know because I just associated that much that things didn't faze me yeah. it's like bother. we were talking earlier it was that that stint was that more of a fix than trying to get to the real mm. deep root of the problem yeah for sure and I didn't really feel traumatized by certain traumas that I've had. So I thought, well, I don't, I'm not, I don't understand why. Mm -hmm. Just made some silly decisions. And like I had things happen that, you know, I still deal with now, but 
but at that stage I was like you know I was thinking that I was doing the work but I wasn't yes it was just like surface level and I got a false sense of reality yeah in 19 months I thought well surely, surely for 19 there. months <laughs> you will be healed forever oh, yeah <laughs> and so I I got parole I stayed in the program finished the program but alcohol was like the new problem for me but I stayed clean for six years became a drug and alcohol counsellor um, got a team leader role at Sunrise Way in Toowoomba and I loved it. It was, you know, like I could finally now help people. It's a chance to give back. Yeah. And yeah. it was awesome, you know, being able to share with people, understanding what they're going through. Yeah. But not realising that I was still at danger. Still there. Yeah. And it was one, I left, I got an um, area manager job with the NDIS company. Mm -hmm. So I went to that job. And then it was just one random day I drank that much that I blacked out and then was out at a tavern met someone that had ice and because, there goes yeah. six years yeah. and I came to and I was like oh, I've just used oh dear mm. and because I had been working in the AOD industry I was like well I can't tell anyone like shame people look up mm. to me I'm public speaking for this rehab I've, I just like internally I thought there's no way I'm mm. not telling anyone so that went on for like maybe two years and then again, I get into a group of people that are like hectic, crazy, you know, yep. face tattoos. You Still know. in Toowoomba? Yeah, Toowoomba, yeah. Yep. And a long, longish story short is someone had left stolen property at my house and I was helping them out in, in this kind of crew of people. I didn't know it was stolen and I had people after me and it was just hectic, messy. And I left the NDIS job and... You know, I had my own house and everything, but I was like, how am I going to get this together? And in my, these people, you know, they knew where I lived. Then I got um, beaten up out in front of uh, the Toowoomba Hospital by these people. So I was thinking, well, how am I going to get out of this mess? Because I hadn't done what they thought I'd done. Mm. And I was, you know, I relapsed after being clean for six years. So it was like shame, big shame. And... All I needed to do at that point was just ask for help yeah. and get over myself. <laughs> no. And so my plan was if I got arrested. <laughs> right? Sounds like a wicked plan. It's yeah. bizarre. Like, <laughs> if I get arrested, then I'm safe from these people. Huh? I can get clean and then I don't have to worry about sorting out my house. I just take me away. <laughs> and it just seems insane that I thought, thought that, that was okay. what I was going to do. So <laughs> that's what I did. Wow. So I stole a car one night, <laughs> drunk, and rang the police to come and get me and told them what I'd done. Mm -hmm. Waiting, they didn't come. So, okay, I, so I drove myself to the police station. Hey. And I'm buzzing, I'm ring, and I end up ringing triple zero. I'm like, this is serious. I'm here to, you know, take, take me away. They thought I was insane. They said, why? And I said, I've relapsed. You know, I'm in trouble with these people. This is my plan of getting better <laughs> getting out of a situation and I've just you know I had a pretty extensive criminal history at this point so I thought I was going to do it but people didn't press charges and I went home so then it was like two days later and this is probably the worst decision I've ever made but I was like I need to step this up so I thought if I hold up a shop they will arrest me for sure so <laughs> I was doing some private NDIS support work at the time. Mm. It was on my bicycle because I got done DUI because I handed myself in. Yeah. And I rode to the corner shop and waited in line and then had a knife and said, I'm really sorry about this, but um, you need to give me the money. I'm not an aggressive, violent person at all. And I, you know, didn't go as well like he was giving me sort of $20 at a time. And I'm like, can you speed this up? Yeah, so I'm ready to see us. Can I serve the other people? I'm really busy. I said, no, this is... This is a robbery. This is really so... Should have been And then he said, no, it is funny. This is, it is. It's comical. It is. Well, the police, they were just like, the, the court, they played the video. And, I'm, and then he served the rest of the people in the line. No one knew what happened. So I walked outside, picked up my bicycle, walked down the road, Left my bicycle on the side of the road. It's a thousand dollar mountain bike. Hmm. I thought I won't need that. 
because I'm going to jail. <laughs> Wish I hadn't lost the bike. But anyway, and I sat down the down the road from the shop, waited for the police, and then I saw them come and I lay on my belly and I said, "Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. So, I've been waiting. I'm really sorry. Tell them people I'm really sorry." <laughs> then one of the guys was like, "You were in the station two days ago." I said, "Well, I told you my plan. This is, you know, mm. an hour off. This is. Thank you. Sorry again." <laughs> So the police did really nice statements in my court case. Like they were, even though they thought I was mad, it was insane. And so I went to the watch house and um, then I realized I still had gear on me and I overdosed in the watch house by accident, had a seizure and then went to hospital, to Warmba Base Hospital with police guards. And I was there for, it has been about a week and a half and the police thought, I'm wasting their time. They had to have two cops with me. Which was, and you know, shackled. And I just thought, you know, it's so not something I would have done. But then they gave me bail, and I was like, I refuse bail. I was, and he said, you can't. And the police, they left, and I was like, this is not working. <laughs> In my what this my plan has gone to shit. Like yeah. it didn't work, <laughs> and so, and it was just only being. I only got um, was lucky that I, I did end up in hospital because I would have been sent on remand for ages. So then I went and stayed with family friends of ours that I'd known from the rehab and they let me live with them. Yeah. Mum packed up my house and then I got clean and sober and was like, you idiot. All you needed to do was make a call and ask for help. And everyone knew the family in, in Greenmount. They got a big property oh, yeah. out there. So that would have been well yeah. a good setting to do it. Yeah, no, awesome. It was good. And they set it up like, you know, I wrote a schedule out. So I had things to do every day while I was waiting to go to jail. <laughs> and, and I just thought you could have just made a phone call. But, you know, it was a humbling experience. Then I went to some day programs where I had ex-clients of mine and they thought I was there facilitating. And I'm like, mm. well, no, I, uh, my name's Beck. And, <laughs> you know, that was pretty humbling, but. Yeah, like I got over myself a lot because I was so overconfident. So rehab, relapse, clean and sober, and then another relapse? So it was rehab, but I was drinking, but I was clean. Yeah. Then relapse, then jail. Yeah. And so... And jail, how long for? I only got four months because there was so much evidence showing that you know, even online, I didn't realize it was online, but it apparently is. There was evidence to show that clearly yeah. you, were an, you, were, well, yeah. you were an idiot. And it was, I, I told them that two days before I've done this because I need, because I've relapsed, you know. Did the plan, it never really worked as such? Well, it did, but I all I needed to do was just make a phone call, just go and get over them. Like, instead of like when you're on drugs, you think all oh, these people are always going to find me, which they won't, you know, that's, it's, that, get caught up in that scene. Do you find that amongst everything else you're working on yourself, is that in the back of your mind? Have, has that crew completely, you've completely oh. disassociated? Oh, yeah, I'm not. Like, there was a couple of things that I was, that were a concern, but with looking back with the bikies, I, that wasn't actual legitimate concern with these people, but it ended up being okay, but that's because I didn't say anything about it people that the police wanted so I was just like mouth shut I'm just staying out of it this is not my scene yeah but I'm not worried about those people anymore but I did I was glad to leave Swamba so we met um we met via another organization that you're in yeah um and then during some uh self-defense classes was, was... which by the way <laughs> she kicked ass <laughs> um star pupil and then yeah you had another one in there. Well, there's a big chunk of the story in between oh, is there? jail and this room. God. Yeah. This is the, I mean, the All right, worst. let's go back. Let's go back. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> Be better. <laughs> so, so where are we? We're, so I, mean, I go to jail. We're in jail, four months. And I was seeing this guy that I'd employed that I was working with, and we ended up in this relationship while I was in jail, and it turned into a DV. Were you in here so, in Brisbane? Yeah. Oh, no, I, like I was still living in Toowoomba. He was in Toowoomba. Which jail were you in? Oh, um, at B yeah, BWC. Yeah. And then at Gatton. Yeah. And so jail was actually, I was just lucky that 
like there were scary moments, but I managed to be able to use humor with my story of why I was there. And that got like, I was just lucky all the way through. So I got you really good. Yourself. Well, if you do that, I, I did that at the start and then people think you're a snob. So <laughs> that didn't work. You've got to not keep to yourself. Mm-hmm. It's quite socially, it's pretty complicated, but I was lucky, so lucky. <laughs> and I just made jokes all the time and just told my stories in a funny way. And they. Well, there's no one. Um... There's no uh, how-to tips, is there? No, and I got it wrong at the start, but then I made friends with the right people all the way through. So I, as an experience, I was extremely lucky. I got really fit, really healthy, then got out and this stuff, this relationship with this guy turned messy within like a month. Yeah. And that turned into a DV relationship, so I had to get go to the police and I left to, I had to leave Toowoomba. So then I moved in with a friend um, at Kangaroo Point who used to be my boss at the rehab that I worked with. Mm-hmm. And she knew all about my story. Um, but as I was having to make, you know, the court case was coming up and then people were taking his side over me and it was just, I was drinking from the most I've ever drunk in my life. And then in June, June last year, it's nearly a year. So can actually. I just ask, you You mentioned drinking a lot. Um, mm. Where does that, like come from like where does the money come from and are you just you walk in and going will this get like will this get me drunk i'll take it like how how does uh, without ducking into your mind maybe too much what's your what's your process for that see this is the part that i found hard because when i was trying to stop drinking i would be there at the bottle shop before i'd even had a plan or a red flag yeah so i dissociated so much that I'd be like, well, why? I don't have a reason why I did it. But I was drinking, you know, like you get alcohol cheap, mm. like, you know, boxes of wine with that. I started getting into that. So even like hand sanitizer at one stage. Mm-hmm. So I was living with my friend trying to get work, but drinking every, every day I was sick and then not drinking to take the hangover away. And that was for a few months. And then in June, I'd booked in to do a hospital detox at the PA and um, I don't remember any of this because of what happened in the next part <laughs> and so I, I got discharged and apparently I walked home went straight to a bottle shop and then at the middle of the day walked to Kangaroo Point and I think I was talking to someone about that I had a plan to jump off Um, I didn't really like looking back I didn't think things were that bad, but I did. I jumped off in the middle of the day, fell 23 metres in one go. Yeah, from the from the top. Um, shattered my pelvis, broke nine ribs, split my head from here all the way back here. So my scalp came off. I had 38 stitches in my head. Like internal bleeding, collapsed lung. You're right, this was the best week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. So I was in I was in a coma for a while and they told mum to notify family that wasn't good because I'd you know, you can fall over and have a head injury mm. from standing up. Mm. It's twenty three metres in one go. Mm. And then as I you know, then I woke up and they said I wouldn't be able to use my left leg and then I got feeling back in that leg and they said it would be hard to walk. It just got as I went, I was there in hospital for about four and a half months. And I remember waking up from the coma, but then I don't remember half of the hospital admission because I was on huge amounts of painkillers, like ketamine infusions, a whole lot. So I was off the planet. <laughs> and that's probably not helping the problem in a way. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah, mum was, and my few of my friends and family were concerned about that mm-hmm. after I'd woken up, but they said she's, her pelvis is shattered shattered like it's in six pieces and there's bone everywhere in there and the pain like i i don't remember before they they didn't know how to fix my pelvis at initially because it was so such a mess and so they had me on these infusions but the only thing i really remember before they did the surgery was when the staff would roll me right to reposition and i would black out and i'd be begging them don't please please leave me lying flat so you're in hospital what, PA? Yeah. How long were you in there for total? About four and a half months. Yeah. And so they then they fused my pelvis back together. It's got a rod. And they, they said, I don't know if it's going to work, but hopefully everything else forms back in it. It's amazing. It does. 
and but I, I didn't remember once they took me off that infusion then it, my memory kicks in mm. and it was just pain I didn't even remember I had broken ribs like the pain in my pelvis was like it, like it would make you see stars and oh, blackout. It still affects you now well I only have which is amazing in itself I've been walking on both legs since November last year like when I came here to do the first mm. Remember I was limping? Yeah. Because I got tendonitis in my knees because I tried to run too early and I couldn't, like I have pain in my tailbone, but only when I sit up for extended periods of time and my left leg is shorter now, but no way to go. But <laughs> so much under your pelvis. Yeah. But like <laughs> everything else, like I'm able to. Headaches, right? No, that, that was the other thing. So. <laughs> Oh, wait, can, there's more. <laughs> the head injury, like I've had my scalp would come off my skull, like I was deep gloved. And they 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 came who found you. Do you know who found you? No, there was witnesses apparently, because it was the middle of the day. Yeah. And it was right down near the stairs, apparently. And I, I love yeah. the way that even now you still say, well, I don't know, but you still say apparently. Because, yeah, I know, right? And <laughs> I gotta stop doing that, but it's because I, I from post traumatic amnesia. You, you don't remember. Well, three, I lost three months of memory. You're only going off the information that was told you. I know well, when I woke up, well, when I remember, when I woke up, I apparently had memory of everything. I could tell them that day what happened, why I did it. And then when they took me off the infusions and I had my surgery, I had, I woke up and it's like I'd woken up the first time and I had no idea what had happened. And I'm like, are you sure that's what I did? Was it, there would have been some real panic. Oh yeah, and I'm like, what have I done to myself? Like, mm. I had no memory three months previous to the fall; it was all gone. So, and Mum's like, well, that's convenient. Mm. And yeah, she goes, we remember. <laughs> like, well, I really don't. But that's from being in a coma; mm. memory was gone. So I, I wasn't convinced I'd done it, but I did it. So I, I didn't. I was shocked for ages. It took me ages to come to the fact that I'd done that to myself and to other people i knew that that was a selfish headspace to be in mm. and it wouldn't just affect me so so out of hospital what happens then so then i got discharged on like 15 scripts and i was on crutches for one till november and they weren't sure how i would recover because you know i was lying flat at mum's i had to move back in with mum yeah um and i was planning to go to rehab because you know this again had happened mm. And, but I'm like, I can't walk properly, so I can't go into rehab. But then I finally was like medically cleared, discharged from surgical team. Oh, the brain injury, but sorry. <laughs> They're coming to me, right? <laughs> saying, well, you've got a brain injury. Yeah. You're going to the brain injury rehab unit after you're clinically better. And I'm thinking, I could really hit my head. You know, I kept forgetting I had stitches. And so the brain injury rehab people came to see me. You would have a wicked scar under your head. Yeah, we could see it there. I'll show you a picture after. It's hectic. So the brain injury rehab people came and spoke to me and they're like, we haven't found the brain injury yet, but you 100% have traumatic brain injury. We're going to do some more scans. Mm. They never found it. And then they, they um, a uni came and did a paper, a study on me and took photos of my head to document how far I'd fallen with no skull fracture. And they said, you've got the thickest skull of anyone we've met, like I had a guy next to me with a brain injury, full, non-verbal, like constricted, and he'd fallen off a push scooter. So that was like mind blowing to me. I thought, wow, you are so lucky. Like this is the last chance you get. You are you, and yeah. I, I keep. This is one thing I keep thinking back to in my head. The universe is not finished with you yet. Like, yeah, <laughs> no. you keep testing it, but they're know. not. And that's that. That was the most mind blowing thing. Because people, every doctor, every day that would come and see me on the ward, they would just be shocked. Okay. They said, we you should, you should be paralysed because where my pelvis broke was where my spine attached. It was one of the big breaks. And they yeah. said, it just doesn't, you can use both your legs. Like, it just, none of it really computed. And wow. they, they still, I went back for reviews and they just said, you're that, the you're girl that, that you know, 1%. with no skull fracture from... Can you pull that phone? That's you. Yeah. And so that was like. They're calling their mates. This is yeah. the one we were talking about yeah. at lunch. <laughs> That's what it's like. And they're taking pictures and document it, you know. Then I fell down the stairs at mum's when I got discharged and put a hole in the wall with the back of my head. 
but I was all right. Would you believe? Panicked though. Went from the top step, crutches stuck under my armpits. And I thought, this is it. I'm breaking everything. Really <laughs> but I actually pulled it off all right. Go on. But yeah. So we're at a hospital. Yeah, at a hospital. And at that stage, I was, I'm not going to get another chance. Like, it was, it really hit home to me how lucky I'd been. Like, it was, a, it was a miracle that I'd even could speak again, you know? What's the conversations with your, like, with your mother like at this point? Because clearly, I mean, you would know in your experience, other families would get to a point where they've just walked away. Mum has. Um, and she's come back. I still apologise to her. Like, if I was her, I wouldn't speak to me because yeah. I have put, I only, it's just me and mum. So she, like, when I lost my nursing, she knew nothing about what had happened at the hospital until she saw seven o'clock news and there I was. That would have been awesome. It was horrendous. Like, I just wanted to die inside. But I was that, you know, thinking, oh, no one's going to care, but we made it very public. Mm. So it started from there, you know, the, disappointment and the embarrassment mm. because I was never I was brought up completely different you know I went to church went to Christian school and then I and then the robbery mum didn't speak to me for about a year after that because she was so hurt that her child could have done something yeah. like that to some other people yeah so at the moment like I've had a few struggles with alcohol but not to where I've gone back into full relapse. So mum has struggled with those times. Um, it's tough. There's the trust is gone. And I know that. So it's hard. We kind of trigger each other. Yeah. <laughs> but we love, like, she, I love her more than anything. And I know that she just wants me to be happy and stay alive. Yeah. And after the, like, it just got worse, you know, losing the nursing, being on the news to doing really well and then, losing it all and going to jail and then jumping off kangaroo point. It's like, what, how could I escalate it anymore? So since then, you would say you've had a couple of, I don't mean, a relapse is a relapse, but you've had smallish. Well, usually like when well, you learn in rehab, which some people sort of, I don't know, disagree with, but for me, if I have a lapse, Call them lapses where you maybe drink one one day and then yeah. you pull yourself up and like, oh, that was stupid, that was dumb. You learned mm -hmm. from it. But relapse was like pull back into your old yeah. old habits of using and how much you're up to. But I'd never had lap lapses before. They were always full blown. So after rehab this time, I think I did 12 weeks at Vinnie's, St. Vinnie's, and then I went to a private uh, mental health retreat for six weeks. And that was why well, I had to really actually work hard and avoid it. <laughs> and yeah. stay. You were saying about that earlier, that place, it wasn't cheap. No. But did, you said that, I guess, the theory in your head that was it by that time this is this is make or break? Oh, I, I would have, yeah, would have done anything. And mum had actually been researching this place mm -hmm. and was talking on the phone to me the night before I jumped. So this is a place called Palladium in Mullaney. We'll get you in there. Don't worry. Right. I don't remember any of that. But so I just planned to get in there when I could, but also do like a public rehab as well. Yeah. So I was willing to do anything. I, you know, I had this chance again. I thought I have to fix something different this time to stay alive because I'm always shocked every time I shock myself. Yeah. I do. I'm like, it's funny. It's like what? nobody's more surprised than me. <laughs> And I'm, it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> so that part, of that, what, there has to be something I'm missing. Yeah. And I hadn't addressed some of the trauma that I'd experienced when I was younger because I didn't feel like I needed to because there was no emotion connected to it. And that didn't get brought up until Palladium? Or... Not properly, yeah. Like I'd always avoided it because I felt uncomfortable, but I was like, well, I'm not emotional like other people are with it, so I'm all right. So where would you rate yourself? Out of ten right now. Out of ten, like, like yeah. What rating out of ten would you give yourself as to being on track? Oh, uh, like when I get a job, I'll be a ten, <laughs> but an eight, I reckon. Do you think you're ever really a ten? Because it's always there. The, the yeah, no. no, when I think I'm a ten, that's when oh red flag. So that's when you let your guard down. Yeah, you get overconfident, and I've done that in the past 
when I relapsed after that six years because I was like, well, mm. you know, I'm clean. Yeah. But get a bit high on your own supply. Oh, yeah. Part of the fun. And you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that took me ages to get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I was overconfident. And then I didn't realize that the, it's still a dangerous window. So, well, I've done the work and mm. I haven't mm. done any work, but. You know, that long in rehab, I thought, well, look at me. Public speaking was a bit, a bit cocky, I guess. Well, we, there's still not a question. One. I know. But that's okay. That, right? That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's again, like, I'm just like, um, <laughs> the, what's the trying to say? Oh, so now, because you're, I guess you'd say a little bit of a rehab pro, <laughs> <laughs> you, oh. you could start writing reviews or something. Yeah. You you said you you still work with others and you still I don't know whether you call it a mentor or a word but you're still involved with other people currently in rehab. Do you see people out there and you try to give advice because you've seen it from you like you just said the people who think they're going well are the ones who sometimes aren't. Yeah, I like you you've gone back to the center that we work back together. Yeah. Do you see people there and you sort of. You don't know where to go. You, you've got a lot of work to do, but you don't think you do or something like that. Well, like since I've been back, since I've finished there, I haven't really had one-on-one -on -one time with many of the girls. But yeah. when I was back in there after the Palladium, I really did notice because I felt in such a different place. Yeah. Um, you know, you can see things in other people. So I was, I mean, always pretty switched on when someone had stuffed up, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But. You can just tell. Yeah. And I think people get stuck on the time frame of programs. And I was at 12 weeks. I tried 12 months. I did 19 <laughs> months. Yeah. <laughs> in, a, in a 12 month program. <laughs> and it's like the time frame is where people get stuck. So you've got years and years of unlearning these habits. Because as I always say in, to the people I work with, you're never fixed. Yeah. It's just your management is, is what yeah. changes. And that's, I think, what I learned this time. Even after Palladium, I had to slip up, and I just because I'd stopped doing my morning routine, I'd stopped doing the things that I was doing in the program, and I thought, well, I can't, you can't stop my, you know, like meditations. My, we're still training, but I wasn't keeping like connected with myself, so I just go off with the, like, what? <laughs> disconnected. I'm very naturally... disconnected. Like the first time you came in, we instantly connected. Yeah. And you're naturally a very outgoing, energetic, extroverted person. Mm. That can sometimes be hard in its own right, isn't it? Yeah, but if I'm, I can be the opposite too, though. If I'm somewhere where I don't know people, I'm a mess. Mm. Like going to uni, I was shaking trying to pick a seat because mm. I'm like, where am I going to sit? No one cares. <laughs> like, no one cares. I've only gotten out over that recently, I guess. Did you um before we do move on the question so, um i guess people's opinions of like you would have made friends and lost friends over the years yeah <laughs> probably lost more than you made or i don't i don't know yeah but then do you still you know I, i'd walk past you on the street and i'll say this often i walk past you on the street i have no idea yeah of what you've been through do you ever feel that you know is it hard to, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the words that someone's not trying to judge you or, like you know. stigma with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like if it comes up in conversation, hi, I'm Beck and I'm a well, I kind of just, I've made the mistake of being too open and with people been, when I should have. Adults. Yeah. Um, but I think because I was sharing my story so much um, years ago with this rehab, it just was everybody knew and like, sharing like, like big details of things that you know I haven't shared today where I just it didn't bother me but I did have to pull back and be yeah. really careful of how much I shared with people I didn't really know because okay. I'm just like well there like and if you judge me stuff, then, then you know oh. yeah <laughs> but it's kind of when I I did an interview with ABC National and the first thing the lady said was oh, you weren't what I expected and so it started the conversation of the stigma about addiction and people in rehab, and I was like, well, I had a career, had several careers, and nobody knew for years that I was doing what I was doing. Well, there isn't a person, is there? there but they isn't. think, you know, it's like someone that's homeless or, you know, I had a good family, even though there was 
things there. I was brought up well, but people have the stigma on addiction. 100%. So I used to, I guess, challenge that when I used to speak. But yeah, that interviewer, it's the first thing she said. And I'm like, well, what did you expect? <laughs> no yeah. kidding. Like, you know, they've got this picture of what you're going to be. But I, yeah, it, it affects everybody. And I hit it for so long because I had, you know, I've got career. Right. Which judge me for using, <laughs> mm. which I lost. But yeah, I, I've had people reactions from people with some of the things I've shared that have been negative, but um, it doesn't really phase me like it used to. Because you're more at one with yourself now. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that palladium, like the self, you've been connected with yourself and learning your self worth. Yeah. And self worth was a massive thing that I worked on. You put me at some point, obviously, the, the kangaroo point incident mm. weren't thinking too highly of yourself. Well, and I learned that I haven't for a very long time because of, you know, I was a nurse and I did these things and I, if I met me, I wouldn't want anything to do with me, that kind of thought. So yeah. that's something I really worked on. Yeah. I'm trying to focus on I am where I am and I've, the things that I've done have been hectic, but you've got to accept it as a whole, mm. you know, and... It would I wouldn't be who I am now if those things hadn't happened. It kind of helped me move past the regret, I guess, of everything. And I guess that's one thing where, um, like we look at second chances, but sometimes we need a twenty-three, third, fourth, or fifth, or oh, six. So many, and it's like I'm very gratitude is something that's mm. massive for me every day since, like you know, being able to walk again. But yeah, that was huge gratitude. I'm very grateful for everything. <laughs> we probably answered a shitload of these other questions, but we'll keep going. So uh, that was birth to now, and I think 40 minutes, but that's okay. More <laughs> There's more to go. <laughs> I, good. Bit I asked you to come here. <laughs> <laughs> um, three reasons you get out of bed every morning. Well, because I'm able to walk and I can. Do you ever do that now? Like you'll take a few steps or get up stumble into the shower or get a coffee or whatever and go this is cool so the sh especially the shower because it used to take me probably 50 minutes to be able to get into the shower and shower it was a process for so long so having shower like, i remember the first shower i had standing up and i was like what? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, like had these little things along the way like even being out off the crutches and being able to walk that was incredibly difficult like and now I don't have a limp like I did it's just insane so then when I started running again like running I was beside myself so, oh, I'm running. and I told the physio yeah. and they said I wouldn't be able to run for you know two years sounds so, like you make a habit of proving proving uh better goes wrong well first time really I've always been pretty accurate with me. <laughs> if you keep doing this this will happen you know what's first the truth um oh my family and I know that I am like my mum like with I have I'm living with her still because you know with everything that happened so she's in Brisbane yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah mum definitely and I want to you know prove to her for the last time that I can get it together and keep it together and like I said before you know like I said there, there's been periods you haven't spoken there would have been like yeah, yeah she's um but in a way, she has always been there. Oh, 100%. Like, and I've hurt her. It's like, that is the biggest regret I have is to her. Of course, her. It's, it's heartbreaking. She had one kid and then I, you know, and she knows I have the potential to do well. And then I mm. do crazy things. So, yeah, proving it to mum, but getting better for myself. You yep. know, now it's different, I guess. Number three. Um, I used to say I'm alive. I've got all my, I haven't lost any abilities, which I thought I would. I can do gym, I can run, I can do all these things that I shouldn't be able to do. Yeah. And I was prepared for that, you know, in hospital, I thought, well, this is going to be difficult. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a disability parking sticker. Cool. Is that? Until the end of the year. <laughs> Half price taxi card that's going to get me in, I guess. <laughs> like, don't get me care. And I said, you're going to be disabled for a long time. Just be laughing, but that's kind of <laughs> I know. And I look at it sometimes. It's got my name on it. I'm thinking, this is a legitimate have you ever, disability card. Have you ever just gone, fuck, I'll just use it? 
Yeah, yeah. I did one time and I felt so guilty <laughs> because I used to get so upset at people doing that. But I'm like, it's legitimate. It's got my name on it. It's not forged or anything. <laughs> but I keep that as a reminder. You yeah, know, it's a memento. If I stay in addiction, I'll, if I'm not dead, I'll be disabled. Yeah. And I was, you know, they were like, you're going to need carers, NDIS, DSP. So being where I'm at now and being able to do everything. Everything that I could before is insane. It's not fair. In it's a way. Again, mate. <laughs> you know? The universe isn't done with you. Yet. Yeah. God's very loud. So <laughs> get it right. Number three, two guilty pleasures that you have. Knackers. Okay. What's your go-to? Large group pan meal with extra onion and cheeseburger. <laughs> or a chicken with extra mayo. Coke, Coke, Coke fan or Coke zero. Because, mm. yeah, you're watching your sugar in your yeah. diet. Yeah. It's got to be healthy, and now I don't like coat. It tastes like beef. But Mac is, oh, there's something in it. It's dodgy. I it, love it. Is it like a... Um, I could eat it every day, every meal. And how many times a week do you Oh, no, I'm trying not to be sick. I'm too poor. You're fighting, <laughs> you're fighting that as well? I'll check on the app to see the specials. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I... <laughs> it's a, like a palladium private there's no caffeine no sugar no gluten and you're a coffee drinker yeah but only like one in the morning yeah right so i came back really healthy but i've slipped a bit with my food first even like the, the gear is one thing but even that would have been rough for the first couple of weeks too because there's a lifestyle associated to it isn't mm, it? yeah but I'd kind of split it too. Like I'd be doing well to other people, but then I'd be in the lifestyle. So yes. I kind of live two different lives. Jekyll and Hyde thing. Yeah. What's another one? Um, what can I think of food? <laughs> ice cream. There's ice cream in the freezer. I can't just have a serving. You know, like people go, oh, I'll just have a bowl of ice cream. Yeah. It's the entire it's thing. Gone. Yeah. And it's an issue. Go to flavor. Vanilla bean. Vanilla bean. Yeah. What's the difference between vanilla and vanilla bean? I don't know. But it just tastes Vanilla better. beans flush out. It's got better flavor. <laughs> Do you have a McFlurry of Macca's or is that... That's oh, yeah. It's caramel, uh, Oreo with caramel top. Oh, my God. Do you, like, know the menu off by heart? Yeah. I worked at Macca's once. Exactly. drive through person of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I to put an electrical tape on the bottom of my shoe so I'd slide to the drive through window quicker. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you want it. Yeah, that was so fast. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> Number four. Oh my god! <laughs> One thing you bought that has literally made you happy every day after. My Harley. Oh yeah. Still got it? No, I just sold it. There was pause there. Well, I I was debating whether to sell it or not because I can't ride it again till August this year. So I sold it. And I'm gonna. Upgrade it anyway. What did you have? Just a street 500, the baby. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get iron 883 next when I get a job. Yeah, definitely motorbike. Is that just another, was it another reminder, I guess, of everything going on? Like, I just need to move forward or? What? I mean, like, so selling the bike because you couldn't ride. Yeah, and I had to. Disappointed. Yeah, and I had to sort. I need to grow up. Yeah, but I'm. But yeah, you're going to yeah, buy another one. Yeah. 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 It's the first thing I'm going to say for. Best thing I've ever bought. Loved it. Yeah. But I like dirt bikes too. Like them all. Put my Harley, yeah. It's so loud. <laughs> my ex Harley. <laughs> That's hilarious. Now, four things you cannot live without. Animate? Animate or inanimate? My dog, Billy. What type of dog? She's a schnauzer. Schnauzer? I wouldn't have picked a schnauzer, but... She's the best love her. How old's Billy? She's four, three. three. So she was around when a bit of the shit was going down? Yeah. And I had her dad was my first now that I had. And that was when things were really bad. But yeah, so my pretend real baby's a pretty baby. Mm -hmm. But yeah, can't live without her. Um, what was it? Four things. Four things. Um. My supports, definitely people. And I've had people stick around through all of this stuff. So you've got your number one's your mum. Yeah. Like she's the number one person to me in my life. Who's your number two? Well, I have a partner, Michelle. 
well, I met at Palladium. Um, so her and her family are pretty important to me and my family. They've, they've stuck around, but they know that the stuff I've done isn't the real me. So it's like yeah. I'm still accepted in my family. We were talking about that earlier, about friend circles. And I guess like you know, we all have that group of friends that almost literally no matter what we do, they are there yeah. for us. Yeah. Even when we don't think they're there for us. Or they are there for us, or yeah. they probably should have gone. You've, yeah, you've got a small group of them. Yeah, and that's. And you would have seen many friends come and go as well. Oh yeah, and I, I kind of this last relapse that I had, I lost, I, um, isolated in a huge way. Like I used to be quite social and have a huge group of friends when I was a nurse, but the last, gosh, since twenty fourteen, I didn't. I just isolated. Mm. I had a few friends, but not. I, I found social things quite intimidating. I was going to say, was, did you feel that might have been yeah. part of the problem? Oh, yeah, like petrified. Like going to a gym, I'd have to Google pictures of the gym to find out where to put my bag when I walked in. Yeah. Like how stupid, no one yeah. cares. Yeah. So like they're all Bex here. <laughs> Nobody cares She's about me. <laughs> like She was it, on the yeah, I didn't that. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my hair now because of my head. They wouldn't know. We had just a rational fear of people. And then, well, you're not that important. Yeah. You know, so I got over that. I don't have to Google where to put my bag. I just turn up. No one can. <laughs> yeah. Stupid. Um, what do we have with Joel? Number three. Um, What I had my kids with. I think what time I support my family. Um, probably my faith, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm not religious as such, but I do believe Something that, that yeah, and I really now believe that more than anything. So, um, do you practice anything to do with that? Yeah, like I, I haven't found a church in Brisbane, but I'm connected with a lot of people. In a church in Toowoomba, um, and like I think I pray every day, saying sorry and thank you, you know. And I'm gonna get to try. So I just like think some of the things that I've went through in my whole life. I just thought I can't believe that not something there. So that kind of keeps me. Well, like you said, the doctors say you're not meant to be alive. Yeah. So kept drowned for something for purpose. So yeah, and I guess hope. Is the other thing that I wasn't couldn't live without. Yeah. Yeah, hope for. Hope for what? Or what are you hoping or when you say hope? That things will get better and I will get it together. Even though I've had it together before and then I lose it. Hope like, that I can be happy and like you said, you you're probably under a false pretense. You thought you had it together, but you yeah, were no idea. On the surface of <laughs> work. I guess hope you know, being sure of who I am as a person and being confident in myself. Hope that, you know, there you know, recovery it's hard, but it's like a lot easier than being in it. So yeah. I just hope that I can stay on the right path. Because I couldn't escalate things anymore, you know? Like what me? I don't know what else you could do, mate. Like that's it. There's no more escalations. <laughs> Step it up every time. I keep playing <laughs> that robbery in my head. It, it, like that's the stuff you could have put in a comedy movie. I know, and it, <laughs> oh, but it was like terrible. When you think of what I, for him, the guy is serving. It was the gentleman yeah. like here. Oh, hang on, I just got to serve this. He like, said he couldn't understand what I was saying, and I was like, I'm going to show a ring. The lady behind him was panicking, and I, I'm just like, I'm sorry, but can you, you? I know you've got more money in there because he gave me twenty dollars. And close the till, and I'm like, I'm rubbing him in the robbery. Yeah. And he's like, what? Been. And he kept I saying, I keep thinking in my head, I shouldn't be laughing at this, but it's just, it's... <laughs> yeah, I'm crying. I, I find it comical. Yeah. This is a story I used to get make friends with Jay. <laughs> but it was like, even though I didn't really think of if he'd been affected by that, that's right, traumatized, that's horrendous, that's awful. But he was just like, I couldn't understand what she was saying. I asked her if I could serve the other people because I was busy, and he served the whole rest of the line. Like, it was just 
And I said, thank you. I'm off. Going there. <laughs> I'll, down, I'll just be down the road. Just Let them know where I am. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's just, it's that's just hilarious. It's it just hilarious. All right, question seven. <laughs> if you were not doing what you're doing in life right now, oh God, what would have been option well, number two? So this is hard because legally I'm not allowed to do the things that I would pick to do. Like, can't work as a nurse anymore. Can't work. Let's remove legal out of it. Let's go uh, parallel universe. Oh, I'd be still nursing or paramedic. I did six months of law after rehab the first time. Yeah. Thinking I could legally do law and they end of the semester. Like you can never study law so because you of your record. I could, yeah, no, I would never have passed the bar because of my history. Which I didn't really think at the time. But I guess the thing too is it keeps you busy as well. On it. Here's a girl by Jason Derulo. <laughs> Sorry. Jason Derulo. <laughs> We've just had a little bit of a, uh, must have been a Siri thing going on there. <laughs> You'll just have to excuse them for one second. <laughs> is this just part of your comical? Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I wouldn't and have been, we're back. I wouldn't have picked a ruler there. I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> anyway, so nursing you loved? Yeah, but I probably would have. I would have done law. Why? I find it interesting the cases. Except I don't know if I would have wanted to study law. That was full on. It's full on. But I've I, never done it, but I can only imagine. I had a law or nursing or paramedic. Mm -hmm. Help with people. I loved it. I love working in health. Was that the best? Probably paramedic because I found emergency super exciting. So paramedic could be even better. So what I see there is I see a pattern that you want to help. Oh, yeah, for sure. And now I don't know what to do for that. I'm going to be sparky, <laughs> fixing. I think um, even that's helping, I guess, isn't it? Kind of, yeah. But is that going to be, is that just, what would you say? Is that all that's on offer at the moment or... No, I sort of made the decision to, I was going to go back into drug and alcohol counselling, but I sort of felt like doing something totally different and just leaving all of that behind me this time. And that's, not, a, that's a fair decision. Yeah, so I, um, I got a trade assistant job with this friend of a friend. Um, I get to wear high vids. <laughs> oh, I love high vids. <laughs> so good. My stool cut boot. Uh, so I'm trying to get an apprenticeship from that, and I think it it's less stressful when I think about work, just doing something completely different. Yeah. And I can't go back into health, so I thought I'll just get a trade, and then I've got a ticket. It's you know. And because you, I guess, have you have you got closure on those sorts of things that you now can't do, or does it just every now and then pop up? You go ah. Oh. Oh, that's right. It's uh, yeah. I don't know if I ever dealt with that properly, but I think it's harder because I lost it all, then got got it back, and then had a career, then lost it all that again, and now I'm trying to get it back again. So do it once, you can do it again. Yeah, this is certain things like, um, like I would have been able to get back as a, in as a nurse before I did the robbery. Yeah. But that's completely off the table. Like it just won't happen now, and I know that. But it does pop up, like when I'm on seat, and it'll, these jobs, uh, you would uh, be a strong candidate. No, like, uh, anything with you know police you check. To change your filters. Yeah, so that kind of is that is disheartening. I get, mm. you know, because I know I can do really good roles in jobs, but that's consequences, I guess. Actions and consequences. Mm. Number eight. Look, well, I was powering through. No. Oh, I've got more. Oh, I'm, I'm coming back. <laughs> this, I'm going to go back to question one. Um, <laughs> one time you have backed yourself when everything else was telling you to give up. Just one time? <laughs> I, get, I think that would be from coming out of hospital. Yep. Uh, and walking again. Like, I, I, re I was prepared not to physically get better. Mm -hmm. But yeah, back myself more than I ever have. 
as I really want to be here. I want to were you just that. not going to take that for an answer? Like, so obviously you were having physio and walking and all that sort of thing. Were you a um? Were you a persistent patient? I think, yeah, in head wise I was, but I kind of would, you know, I they'd tell me, you know, this is an option, you might not be able to do these yeah, things, yes, and I'd be like, oh, turn it up. <laughs> but it could have been, it was a real possibility. I just sort of, yeah, I don't know. I think I just wanted to get better so so much. And I really don't know why I did come as far as I had from where I was at. So I kind of was lucky, but I I was pretty determined, yeah. So I just don't think you were done yet, were you? No. <laughs> right. You've probably got more than three. But number nine, three pieces of advice to people that are finding reasons not to back themselves to instead back themselves. Number one. Three. Uh I, I, you shouldn't worry about what other people think. Like, even when I was nervous about going to a new gym, it didn't matter. Like, I was missing no out cares. because, yeah, no one cares. No one's looking at you. You need, like, the biggest thing I've learned recently is having, learning my self-worth gave me confidence that I have got qualities out of a person and it just makes you like I still do the cowboy walk. <laughs> yeah, true. Just to give context <laughs> in our um in our self-defense courses we do with the uh with the women's uh shelter we um we do a lot of awareness exercises and um <laughs> the catchphrase is they have to walk like a cowboy where they have their eyes up their chest up and they're um they're showing confidence as they walk and they're not grounding their shoulders. Yeah. Can you just, without standing, give a little bit of a walk like a cowboy look? <laughs> <laughs> but I used to walk, but like, with my head down and yeah. well, probably because I was, couldn't walk properly. But 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 no confidence, just being places and that that exercise I still remember. And you're constantly getting you would like you said you you're constantly getting the hits. And again, like I said about you being on the news, ninety percent of people would have watched that. And within 10 minutes, forgotten the name, just gone, oh, there was such and such. But you, oh, yeah. you would have been walking down the street going, oh, do they recognise me? I was a little bit, but I was more, yeah, oh, at times, but I was more concerned about the people that knew me that saw it. Because that's the people we want to hide it. Well, I'd like to yeah, say, actually, every, it might be everybody saw it. Like, yeah. it was, I wasn't so worried about other people recognizing me unless it came out or I was at that hospital that I worked at, that would that would have been bad. Were there people at the hospital that knew? No. So no. You, you managed to fly it on that's see, that's work in itself, isn't it? Except when I was on the ketamine infusion and I'm laying flat in bed, apparently I don't remember this, but I kept saying apparently. <laughs> but okay. someone to press the buzzer and I'd be like, it's okay, I'm a nurse. And mum's like, you're not a nurse. You were one, shut up. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of that. So I was telling people I was a nurse and I could help the nurse help the patient when I'm like bedridden. Yeah. Like an idiot. Shame. What work were you, what sort of nursing were you doing? Uh, I was in respiratory, acute respiratory ward for oh, most of the time, emergency, a little bit nicer. Yeah, right. But yeah. Got another piece of advice? Um, don't aim too low for uh, things. I, I think it's quite often we get told to aim to don't aim too high. Yeah. It? I've just found in my experience of because I've had made these mistakes and I've had guilt and shame, I've expected like minimum for myself when I should expect good things. Sort yeah. of like aim too low. Yeah. Like, well, I'm this person now and I've done this and that and this is all I'm gonna this is all I'm worth, kind of thing. Mm. And I should, you should expect more for yourself because, and yeah, learn your self worth that you do deserve good things no matter what you've done. You said um, you had that initial trauma as a teenager, and that basically started the spiral. And now you said when you're at Palladium, however many, what was that, a good twenty odd years later, 
Well, then initially it's stuff that happened when I was about five or six, which I'd blocked out of my memory until this thing happened at a party. That was the same kind of yeah. thing. So it was, and I didn't feel affected by that for, yeah. at all. And all of that stuff. And addressing that now, that sort of is getting you. Well, I guess realizing how I disconnect from mm -hmm. events, but trauma does make an impact on you, no matter if you recognize it or not. Because I couldn't like name feelings. I'd be like, oh, I'm a good move on, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, and you have to sit and go through it. I guess that was, I had never done that before because I didn't feel like I needed to. So that was hard. Hated it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to do this. It's uncomfortable. Because you had to admit to it. Or you well, just that, having, vulnerability, that vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't like feeling uncomfortable. I'd rather feel comfortable. So I'd choose comfort. Which <laughs> in your obviously in you know, we have um us us that don't have a lot to do with it, have this um vision of what rehabs are like, like you're sitting in a circle <laughs> and I, my like name. 28 days like, yeah, yeah 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 yeah. that's it that movie i thought that was that did you think that's what it was like i thought you go to rehab you know you sit under a tree with some people and play guitar if you feel like it you go back for a nap you do a little bit of chores it was nothing like it i thought it'd be like chill out time was there ever times where you were in rehab knowing you have to be in it but you're like i fucking hate this place i think the first when I first went in, once I'd made the decision that I was going to do rehab, mm. there was no, like I decided it. For me to get in the door, I wasn't leaving until I'd done it. So I stayed for 19 mm -hmm. months. So it was different. Like I used to get surprised when I'd see people fail or be like, oh, I'm not doing it. Once I made the decision, I was sticking to that. Yeah. Um, I think when I... So I finished the program, the first program at 15 months and then stuffed up with alcohol. Then I had to go back for three months. I hated that. I was like, I hate this program. You hate it because you failed it. Yeah. And well, you thought you Yeah. Failed. Well, I had, you know, that didn't have this restoration program, but that was hard. But once I made the decision to do it, I'm pretty good. It's good. Yeah. Third piece of advice. Oh, geez. I guess don't don't judge people too harshly. Say like I and I've done it before where you know I've judged others, but there's always reasons why people act That's good. in a certain way. We we talk about that in here a bit. You know, like you'll be you'll be standing behind someone or standing in front of someone at Coles and they're going off or something. Yeah. We just straight away go, oh, you know. <laughs> but then you go, maybe five minutes ago they were just on the phone to their boss yeah. and they fired them over the phone. Maybe they just had a real big argument with their partner. Yeah. You, you know, like, and this is, again, why one reason I wanted to interview you was there is so much going on with you. <laughs> yeah. But... You don't seem to have any problem, not not problem with what anyone else is doing, but your judgment factor on other people these days, is it nearly non-existent? Oh, yeah, like, I, just for someone to offend me, take it's massive, like, mm. it, it, I've, I, it's hard to tell me something that you've done uh, where I'd go, oh, I would never do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, say, I say a similar thing, but you know, I haven't um, I haven't stolen a car and driven it to a police station, but um, <laughs> but I I say that to people. You're gonna you're gonna have to do really well to offend me or have me judge you. Yeah, oh, I yeah. Because you must <laughs> cause again, you would still like when you're going for that apprenticeship when you're getting other jobs. There's information that you have to disclose. Yeah, so it's. And is that a Tough. that's a nervous point? Well, it's hard applying for jobs because there's you know I've had to learn. Like I've always, I've never hidden it completely from a workplace. Like I've that's told them eventually, to but if they ask me the question, I'll always be upfront. Yeah. But I know that there's certain industries or 
jobs that I can get into where it's not mm. a problem. Mm. Uh, but I do get nervous about that. And I look at like my record and I think, oh. I wouldn't hire me. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the oh, I wouldn't. But then I would, like, I feel like I'm a hard worker, but it's like it's, I can't believe I've done those things. Like, I was 30 before I got in trouble with the police, yeah. officially on paper. <laughs> Yeah, it's tricky. Like, like, I just got away with them. I don't know. No, I was 16. Oh, I first stole a car when I was 16 and crashed it into a park car. You left that out. And like then took it minutes. back. Yeah. And then took it back? Yeah, and dropped it back. I only needed it to get somewhere and then get back. I wasn't taking it forever. No, no. Just borrowing it. Yeah, that's the first time I got in trouble with the police. <laughs> oh, I felt guilty now. The final thing, and then I'm gonna, <laughs> I've got a couple of other questions. A quote to live by. <clears throat> I had one and I knew I'd forget it. I, was curious. I used to have this quote and now I'm unsure about it, but um, you you only regret the risks you didn't take, something like that. And I'm like, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can use that one anymore. <laughs> But you probably take risks every day still in one way or another. Yeah, but not like before. Oh, no. I'd be like, well, I'm going to do risky stuff because otherwise I'll regret not doing it mm. or it's the opposite. But um, no, I had a quote. I can't remember. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to that. Yeah. What, um, so to, I guess go, go back to question one or <laughs> maybe the whole thing. I guess to put it, to put it bluntly, You've had a pretty, for not even 40 years of age, you've had a pretty interesting life so far. Yeah. Yeah, massively. But you're still here. Yeah. And from everything I can see, yes, you've done some very stupid shit. <laughs> but deep down, you're a very good person. Yeah. Where do you see yourself in probably 10, 15 years? Or, or to give that another way... How do you feel your purpose is right now? Or where do you, where does Beck want to go from here? Like at the moment, I'm kind of in a bit of a limbo, just with work and that kind of being a bit slow. As you said before, if you got a job, you'd be 10 out of 10. Oh, yeah. and I'm, So that's yeah. this real feeling like I'm I'm getting there. I'm here. Yeah. And it, having a job, I've never not worked. Like, this is the longest I've not had a job for. But then on the flip side of that, you said, one thing or a lot of people relapse when they think yeah they're a 10 out of 10 so are you a different nine or 10 out of 10 now to what you were 10 15 years ago yeah oh definitely like at palladium i first time i felt like things had actually changed internally and that i've learned being being connected more connected to myself. I'm so lost with who I was and what I had done when I'd done. So what was the scope of people like at Palladium? Oh, all different. It was And again, this is the thing like this lifestyle, like we were saying, it doesn't discriminate. Can be yeah. anyone. There's no one fit. Yeah. Well, at Vinny's rehab there was there was a nurse, a doctor, um and then, you know, like a couple of people that have never worked before. So it's a whole mix. But at Palladium, it was sort of a little different. It was um, pilot, someone from the mines, a couple of nurses, ex-police, yeah. a few ex-police there. Um, but it was like, that's not, it wasn't a rehab, it was like a mental health retreat. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's the underlying that's stuff to it. part of the work for you, isn't it? Yeah, oh, definitely. Because this is the thing that you need, yeah. pointing to my head, by the way. This <laughs> is the thing that you need in check the most, isn't it? Yeah. And you feel that's in check more than it's been in recent years. I think that I've learned more about myself than I had before, which I've got answers for why I've done things that I've done. Like it, but I have to keep putting the work in and sort of being in limbo. You know, I've always had my own place. I've always had a job. And now, you know, living with my mum, trying to get into a new profession so that part's hard so I have to keep in check with myself I just have to make sure I'm um so because I disassociate so 
so often and quickly. Yeah. I have to make sure that I'm present with myself every day. Yeah. So, and mindfulness. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I was so unmindful. I didn't realize, but all of that ties into being, keeping yeah. in check with myself. And it seems like you are, because you're dropping those words, mindfulness, gratitude. Oh, yeah. That stuff, it sounds all fluffy. Like, be mindful. Yeah. You well, know. I guess you'd have your sharing, <laughs> and there would be points like you going, oh, fuck. Yeah. But oh, there yeah. You go. Meditation. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, but, it, <laughs> <your own>. <laughs> <laughs> but I could do, get into a meditation so quickly, I have no thoughts. Yeah. Apparently, that's a strength. <laughs> I can empty my head really quickly. you got such a thick skull. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, so you get, so again, back to the original question you get a job. Um, yeah, where do you see yourself, or where do you hope to be in like, Five to ten years, three years, five years. That the things that I want back that I've had, you know, like I want to buy an, a house, have my own place again. Want the Harley? Oh yeah, yeah, first <laughs> that's first, and then I want to be able to buy a place again. You know, have have a stable job, and not be not be struggling with addiction every day, just being happy. And it not because it does get easier over time. And the happier I am in myself, the less I struggle with it. How does it go now socially? So when I say socially, I mean you've got friend circles that are obviously in the same boat as you, but there's no, you know, if they're going out to dinner at the pub or anything like that, or if there's that sort of thing, is that something that you just don't go to or you can switch no, can, that off? No, I can switch that off. Like um when we have family things, I mean they all hmm. there's always alcohol and it's not if I'm... Does your mum have a glass of wine? Yeah. Oh, I should, sorry. No, no, no. And you can switch that off. Yeah, I can. Because so, obviously you would have met some people that can't. Like, it yeah, just needs to be out of my life. There's been times where it hasn't been good for me and I've not realised until after I've slipped up. And I yeah. think, well, I was thinking about it a lot because it was... Yeah. I was around it a fair bit. So... But it's just my mindset's kind of changed about it. Where I don't... Before I was every day thinking... Just don't drink, don't drink, don't use. And now it's like, well, I don't really want to do those things because I want better for my for my life. Whereas it was so different before. Yeah. So like I want good things for me because I deserve good things. So like get me shit together. <laughs> so it's like it's not it's a different kind of it's not a craving that I have that's a want where yeah. I just want to wipe everything out. I, I don't want to yeah. I don't want that for myself anymore because I find that sad when I think of, you know, a friend doing the things I was doing, I'd be like, that's really sad, you know? Mm. So having more, I guess, self-confidence and self-worth has made me want different things properly. I guess for the first time ever, really. The other question I have, do you feel like, like you said, you're 39, are you 40 this year? Next year. It's okay. Yeah. Probably, probably 50 in 11 years. <laughs> Look at me now. Two years. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Do you feel that that's 20 years of my life I'll never get back? Yeah, 100%. I. And I, does that keep you awake at night sometimes? It's something that I've, I've struggled with recently, but. The what if, the what if I didn't do this? Yeah. Where would I be? Yeah, I think work-wise it's tough because I, I would have been a nurse for 20 years this year. Yeah. But I've kind of, with what I did at Palladium, worked, you know, accepting, accepting everything as it is yeah. and having no regrets is, is so, it's so hard. Mm. And I've got to work on that. And I just think, oh, I'm halfway through my life, I'm really dead, it's over. I should have a house, I should have kids, you know. You want, should have all these things, but... Yeah, it's a process that I've had to work on. And I did lose a lot of years. But then in saying that, I've done a lot of things. Like I've travelled more than most people. Yeah. I've I've been really lucky to do some amazing things that's, in the midst of all that. That's well, something somewhere like Palladium would have reminded you of all these things you still actually have done. Yeah. And then, chasing, like you said, chasing for self-worth. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. You just thought I was getting stuck on everything I'd done. Like going to jail was never like everyone was like, "What? Why would you? 
you know, modified. And again, that's that's a stigma. So you, we have a chat. Yeah. I wouldn't go, oh yeah, you know, uh, you've definitely been inside. <laughs> you <know. laughs> you've been inside. Yeah. <laughs> Rough <ass. laughs> Um probably the last question. Yeah. Are you the happiest you've been in a while? Yeah, I think ever. I kind of go between but there's still shit days. I think at the moment it's I'm in the best place I've ever been, even though I'm um like compared to when I think back, when I was twenty four, I was doing really well at work, I had a partner, we had a house together. And I look back and I think, and we were traveling a lot overseas. And I look back and go, well, that was the time where I had everything together. Mm. We're still partying, but it wasn't a problem. Mm. Had heaps of friends, good, you know, close with family. Everything was how I saw it. Good. But now in myself, I guess I'm a lot more connected and happier in myself, even though my circumstances are a bit tough. Like you said, I mean, the job, the travel, the house, whatever. They're just things. Yeah. It sounds to me, and like we've spoken more now, obviously, than we had in any of our sessions. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned more about you, obviously, now. <laughs> Some I've gone, whoa. <laughs> Some I've gone, that's hilarious. But I can see, and I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to put it on air, the look on your face coming in here compared to sessions because I haven't seen you for about yeah, a month or two. I can see just a change in your face. I can. Yeah. Cool. I can just see that you're just more, I don't know, I don't know what word you call it, like you're more at peace, you seem more yeah, oh, for in sure. control. I am, like I'm happier in myself. I feel the safest in myself I've ever felt. Yeah. I'm not where I want to be, but I get impatient, so... Could be a lot worse place. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm meant to have carers looking after me. <laughs> oh, parking sticker. No, well, yeah. That blows my mind. It's got my name on it. <laughs> Ballad to the next year. End of next year. Like you said, you need to keep that and go, that yeah. could have been me. I think, like, being grateful for what I've gotten back from what I've lost all over again just keeps me in a better headspace. And it's going to get better. It's just... Well, and this is what happens when you do the things you do. You've got to work to get it back all you, back. You can't make up twenty odd years of fucking shit up in no. six weeks. Yeah, and this is yeah. <laughs> so it's like a lifelong thing. This is like we were talking before about time frames. Yeah. People do their oh, eight yeah. weeks and go, that's me done. Yeah, he was thanks to it. It's just the stuff. <laughs> right. We were we were talking about it. I was talking to the girls yesterday about it. And um we were talking about milestones and stepping stones. You finishing those sorts of things, if you treat it as a milestone, it's like this big event <laughs> and we're done. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's just another day. Yeah. You, like you said, you, you've you come out, you're, you're clean, got everything happening, but you still got to get a job. And then when you get a job, you got to get a house. And then when you get a yeah. house, you got to be able to pay for it. And yeah. There's all these other things. I can't wait for all those problems to have. So exciting. You almost miss them, don't you? I don't, I do. I'm not even being so happy. <laughs> Can't wait to have an Miss being an adult. Like, you can get bills sent to me that. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it funny? Like, we forget, <laughs> like, you know, people will open the letterbox and just cringe, but yeah. you're looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm like, this is my letterbox. <laughs> I've got a bill to pay. It's true. I can't wait for that. I can't wait. Um, but it is, yeah, it is tough. At the moment, I guess, in the way with the economies, I don't know. It's, yeah, oh, look, trying to get more work. But I think personally, if through what you've been through and what you're still working on, <laughs> you know, a house that's a little bit more expensive than it should be, I reckon you'll kick that quite easily. Yeah, I reckon too. Um, Beck Cooper. <laughs> Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Um, just so everyone knows, when I did hit back up for this, there wasn't any hesitation. And I really appreciate, and I asked you at the start before we recorded, was there anything that 
because you don't want to talk about. And the fact that you are even through all you've been through, and like you said, so many moments where, <laughs> like, you know, the news is coming on and you go, that looks like, oh, shit, it is. <laughs> My hair looked good that day. Did it? Yeah, that's one thing I remember. I looked good. <laughs> <laughs> like joking about it, right? I'm still trying to thought again. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. You're welcome. Um, the fact you still had all those moments, you honestly like laugh about them. And that could be like people can go, oh, that's a mask, whatever. It doesn't matter. The fact you're sitting here and it's you're just going, and there was this, and then there was this, and then you stopped me and went, oh, no, wait. Yeah. Then there was that. Yeah. The fact you're so upfront, you're an open book. Um, I think that Thanks. you are yeah, you're quite inspirational. Thanks, man. And uh, thank you for joining us Thanks. on the Kyle Reba podcast. Yeah, Kyle Reba Ninja. Yeah. <laughs> Not exactly. Guys, um, when we uh, get these up and running, you'll be seeing these. And please make sure you subscribe, like, share, do all that stuff. Um, we'll be interviewing more people like Beck, um, more people that have backed themselves, and more people that are just all around Definitely. really <laughs> awesome people. That was awesome. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. We'll see you later, guys, and see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Kyle Reba podcast and thank you for taking the time to listen to another amazing person that is doing amazing things that is just like you and I and like you is capable of greatness. So make sure that you listen to this, take away something from it and use that to inspire you to back yourself and become something that you could have never dreamed you're possible of becoming. Please make sure you listen to future episodes. Please make sure you follow, like and share all our channels because let's get the word out that everybody, everywhere, no matter who they are, is capable of doing some pretty amazing things. Thank you again for listening and we'll see you on the next one. My name's Kyle Reba. See you soon.